Good evening and welcome to Postmark Filmwork Series, Our Bridges, Stories from When. I'm your host, Deborah Catherine. I'm an artist in Campbell County and a board member of Postmark. Our format for this series begins with a short reading from literature. Tonight's selection is from A Pioneer Mother a monograph written by Hamlin Garland, copyrighted by the author, and first published in the year 1922 by the Torch Press in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Let us begin. A Pioneer Mother. She was neither witty nor learned in books nor wise in the ways of the world. But I contend that her life was noble. There was something in her unconscious heroism which transcends wisdom. And now that her life is rounded into the silence whence it came, its significance and wisdom appears. To me, she was never young for I am her son, and as I first remember her, she was a large, handsome, smiling woman, deft and powerful of movement, sweet and cheery of smile and voice. She played the violin then, and I recall how she used to lull me to sleep at night with simple tunes like Money Musk and Dan Tucker. She sang too, and I remember her clear soprano rising out of the singing of the Sunday congregation at the schoolhouse with thrilling sweetness and charm. Her hair was dark, her eyes brown, her skin fair, and her lips rested in lines of laughter. Her first home was in Green's Coulee, in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, and was only a rude little cabin with three rooms and a garret. The windows of the house overlooked a meadow and a low range of wooded hills to the east. In this house, she lived alone during the two years of the Civil War, while my father went as a volunteer into the Army of the Tennessee. Though my mother worked hard, she had time to visit with the neighbors 
and often took her children with her to quilting bees, which they enjoyed. For they could play beneath the quilt as if it were a tent, and run under it for shelter from imaginary storms. My father's return from the war brought solace and happiness, but increased her labors, for he set to work with new zeal to widen his acres of plowland. I have the sweetest recollections of my mother's desire to make us happy each Christmas time, and to this end she planned jokes for herself and little surprises for us. We were desperately poor in those days, for my father was breaking the tough sod of the natural meadows and grubbing away trees from the hillside, opening a farm, as he called it, and there was hardly enough extra money to fill three stockings with presents. I could see now that she was only a big, handsome girl, but she was my mother, and as such seemed an old person. Her physical strength was very great. I have heard my father say that at the time he went away to war, she was his equal in many contests, and I know she was very deft and skillful in her work. She could cut and fit and finish the calico dress purchased in the morning of the same day. She cooked with the same adroitness, and though her means were meager, everything she made tasted good. She liked nothing better than to have her neighbors drop in to tea or dinner. After all, I do not remember very much of her life while in Winnesheek County, Iowa, whereto we moved in 1869. She remained of the same physical dignity to me, and though she grew rapidly heavier and older, I did not realize it. My second sister, Jessie, came to us while living in an old log house in a beautiful wood just west of Hesper. And I now know that my mother never recovered from the travail of this birth, though she returned to her domestic duties as before, and was to her children the jolly personality she had always been. While living on this farm, smallpox came to our family, and we were all smitten with this much dreaded disease. But mother not only nursed her baby and took care of us all, but she also smiled down into our faces without apparent anxiety, though some of us lay at death's door for weeks. Shortly after we recovered from this, we moved again. I don't know what her feelings were about these constant removals, but I suspect now that each new migration was a greater hardship than those which preceded it. My father's adventurous and restless spirit was never satisfied. The sunset land always allured him, and my mother, being of those who follow their husband's feet without complaining word, seemed always ready to take up the trail. With the blindness of youth and the spirit of seeking which I inherited, I saw no tear on my mother's face. I inferred that she too was eager and exalted at the thought of going west. I now see that she must have suffered each time the bitter pangs of doubt and unrest which strike through the woman's heart when called upon to leave her snug, safe fire for a ruder cabin in strange lands. She had four children at this time, and I fear her boys gave her considerable trouble. But her eldest daughter was of growing service in working about the house as well as in tending the fair-haired baby. But work grew harder and harder. My father purchased some wild land in Mitchell County, Iowa, and we all set to work to break the sod for the third time. A large part of the hardship involved in this fell upon my mother, for the farm required a great many hands, and these hands had enormous appetites, and the household duties grew more unrelenting from year to year. Our new house was a small one, with but three rooms below and two above, but it had a little lean-to which served as a summer kitchen. It was a bare home, with no touch of grace other than that given by my mother's cheery presence. Her own room was small, and crowded. But as she never found time to occupy it save to sleep, 
I hope it did not trouble her as it does me now as I look back at it. Each year, as our tilled acres grew, churning and washing and cooking became harder. Until at last it was borne in upon my boyish mind that my mother was condemned to never remitting labor. She was up in the morning before the light cooking breakfast for us all, and she seldom went to bed before my father. She was not always well, and yet the work had to be done. We all worked in those days. Even my little sister ran on errands, and perhaps this was the reason why we did not realize more fully the grinding weight of drudgery which fell on this pioneer's wife. We had plenty of good wholesome things to eat in those days, but our furniture remained poor. Our little sitting room was covered with a rag carpet which we children helped to make, tearing, sewing, and winding rags during the winter nights. I remember helping mother to dye them also, and in the spring she made her own soap. This also I helped to do. Churning and milking we boys did for her, and the old up-and-down churn was a dreaded beast to us, as it was to all the boys of the countryside. We had a clothes wringer and washer, and a barrel churn came along, and they helped a little, but work never lets up on a farm. There are always three meals to get, and the dishes to wash, and each day is like another so far as duties are concerned. These were my happiest days, and I hope I carried something of my larger outlook back to my mother. I enjoyed mother's pies and donuts and self-rising bread, which enabled me to sustain life joyously from Monday morning till Friday night. She never seemed to tire of doing little things for my comfort, and I took them, I fear, with the carelessness of youth never thinking of the pain they caused. I did not even perceive how swiftly she was growing old. She still shook with laughter over the tales of school life and sent me away each week with the products of her loving labor. She never expressed her deeper feelings. She seldom kissed her children, and after we grew to be boys of 12 or 14, she never embraced us. She still continued to threaten to trounce us, a menace which always provoked us to laughter. Mother's whippings don't last long, we used to say. Our home remained unchanged. The expense of opening a farm, of buying machinery and building barns, made it seem necessary to live in the same little story and a half house. The furniture grew shabbier, but was not replaced. My mother's dresses were always cheap and badly made, but so were the coats my father wore. Money seemed hard to hold even when the crops were good. I cannot recall a single beautiful thing about our house, not one. The sunlight and the songs of birds, the flame of winter snow, the blaze of snow crystals, I clearly call to mind. But the house I remember only as a warm shelter where my mother strove to feed and clothe us. But as nearly all other homes of the neighborhood would or were of like character, I don't suppose she realized her own poverty. At last, great change came to us all. The country was fairly filled with settlers, and my father's pioneer heart began to stir again. And once more he planned a flight into the wilder west. And in the fall of 1881, when I was 21 years of age, we parted company. I turned eastward, intent on further education. I mention this going, especially because when it became certain that my people were leaving never to return, the neighbors thronged about the house one August day to say goodbye, and with appropriate speeches presented mother with some silver and glassware. 
These were the first nice dishes she had ever owned. And she was too deeply touched to speak a word of thanks. But the givers did not take so much virtue to themselves. Some of them were women who had known the touch of my mother's hand in sickness and travail. Others had seen her close the eyes of their dead. For she had come to be a mother to every one who suffered. Those who brought the richest gifts considered them a poor return for her own unstinting helpfulness. I shall always remember that day. I was about to go forth into the world as our graduating orations had declared we should do. My people were again adventuring into strange lands, leaving the house they had built, the trees they had planted, and the friends they had drawn around them. The vivid, vivid autumnal sun was shining over all the lanes we had learned to love and sifting through the leaves of the trees that had grown up around us. The familiar faces of the bronzed and wrinkled old farmers were tremulous with emotion. The women frankly wept on each other's bosoms, and in the hush of that golden day, I heard the sound of wings, the wings of the death angel, whose other name is Time. I knew we would never return to this place, that the separation of friends there beginning would last forever. The future was luminous before me, but its forms were too vague to be delineated. I turned my face eastward with a thought in my brain beating like the clock of the ages. In such moments, the past becomes beautiful, the future a menace. I have a purpose in this frank disclosure of my mother's life. It is not from any self-complacency, God knows, for I did so little and it came so late. I write in the hope of making some other work-weary mother happy. There's nothing more appealing to me than neglected age. To see an old father or mother sitting in loneliness and poverty, dreaming of an absent son who never comes, of a daughter who never writes, is to me more moving than Hamlet or Otello. If we are false to those who gave us birth, we are false indeed. Most of us in America are the children of working people, and the toil-worn hands of our parents should be heaped to overflowing with whatever good things success brings to us. They bent to the plow and the washboard when we were helpless. They clothed us when clothing was bought with blood, and we should be glad to return this warmth, this protection, and hundredfold. Fill their rooms with sunshine and the odor of flowers. You sons and daughters of the pioneers of America, gather them around you. Let them share in your success. And when someone looks askance at them, stand beside them and say, these gray old heads, these gnarled limbs sheltered me in days when I was weak and life was stern. Then will the debt be blessed. For in such coin alone can the wistful hearts be paid.
Thank you.